Hey guys, Tom Ingram here. And in this video, we're going to talk about some of the recent updates that have been made to Flowwise. Now, if you're like me and you've been busy working your chatbots, uh, you know how easy it is to miss out on some of the updates that the Flowwise team are making to uh, Flowwise every single week. Uh, and so in this video, we're going to try to get caught up and talk about some of the updates that have been made over the past month or so. And so the first update that I want to talk about is the Flowwise support for GPT-4 Turbo and the latest OpenAI embedding models. So uh, apparently with the GPT-4, they had some issues with it being lazy and not returning certain answers. Uh, happens all the time. And so apparently they fixed it with GPT-4 Turbo. And so what I wanted to do, since it was interesting, was I wanted to actually test it. And not just with something like, you know, asking basic questions. I actually wanted to test it uh, using some uh, like financial data to see if it could actually answer questions about um, basically gold prices. And this is interesting because, you know, as uh, the models advance, we want to actually be able to understand exactly what they can do. And, and hopefully, you know, they get better at being able to understand like numbers and, you know, being able to answer questions about trends and, you know, like, you know, uh, data analysis, doing some data analysis rather than simple questions. And so because the GPT-4 Turbo has a context window of 128,000 tokens, we can actually do quite a lot uh, without having to rely just on embeddings. So what I did was I actually uh, downloaded some um, data, some uh, prices for gold and silver, uh, in this case gold, between uh, the years 2019 and 2023. And so what I did then was I basically created, uh, I got the CSV file and I added the entire CSV file to um, the uh, context window uh, for this particular chatbot. So it's not relying upon any embeddings. It's just straight data within the context window. All of the data is within the context window. And then the question I asked was, you know, with $10,000 to invest, what would have been the best time to buy gold? And then what would have been um, the best time to sell go gold? Basically buying low and selling high. And so I ran this a couple times and it kind of gave me pretty much the same types of answers. So in this case, it's telling me that uh, the best time to buy gold within this period of you know, 2019 to 2023 uh, was on November 12th, uh, 2019 when gold was $1,460.70, right? And then the best time to sell would have been on August 6, 2020, when the highest price was uh, $2,069.40. So to actually check this, uh, we actually went to our database and I sorted it based on the uh, close price. And I actually asked this about, I told ChatGPT to actually uh, just look at the uh, the close, not any of the other numbers. And uh, basically this list just shows you, you know, the lowest price, uh, the lowest to the highest. And as you can see, it already got uh, the, um, the lowest price incorrect. It didn't actually get that correct. And I ran it a few times and for some reason, uh, I don't know, it didn't actually uh, come up with the right answer. But when I actually checked the highest price and I go to the uh, the bottom here, it actually came up with the right answer. So, you know, um, you know, this may not be the best example or best scenario, but, uh, and maybe there's other ways of doing this. Uh, but, uh, you know, with all, LM, with all LLM models, you know, you're always gonna get potentially different answers. And so, yeah, this is just a way I just wanted to be able to check the, the data analysis features, capabilities. I imagine you probably will want to do some sort of uh, data, some sort of chat prompting or, um, prompt chaining so you can actually get a more uh, accurate answer or even doing like, you know, multi-agent, uh, a multi-agent workflow to see if you can actually get a better answer. But I just wanted to see, um, this actually was pretty interesting because of the time frame and the ability to actually, you know, paste the entire thing, uh, the entire data set directly into uh, the context window, which is really, really powerful. It opens up a lot of new possibilities. Okay, so let's talk about the embedding models, the new embedding models. So OpenAI, uh, a few weeks ago, they released uh, two new embedding models that are designed to enhance performance for different situations. 
So the first is the text embedding three small model. And what this does is it attempts to create or give you a smaller uh, vector store, a, a smaller vector database while still preserving quality. And so when, when you have a smaller uh, vector database uh, in size, what this does is it actually requires less computing power and therefore less tokens. And so basically they're trying to compress your, um, your embeddings, your vector uh, database, uh, but still retain quality. And so the other model, the uh, text embedding three large, it actually tries to do the opposite. It actually tries to uh, enhance the resolution of your vector database so that you basically get better answers. Now, this will require you know, more tokens, but it actually, in theory, it gives you a uh, higher resolution on your, your vector database. And so in order to test these out, um, I'm using a document PDF called The Art of Game Design. And as you can see, it's 653 pages. Now, this may not be uh, a lot, actually. And I, I suspect that you know, these models are really designed for very, very large data sets. Um, because something like this may not necessarily, uh, there may not be much of a difference, you know, 653. But I wanted to test it anyway. And so what I did was I created three different chatbots with three different embedding models. So I have the ADA embedding model, I have the embedding three small, and I have the embedding three large. And um, what I did was I basically just asked them the same types of questions. And again, you know, I wasn't expecting, um, you know, like really different answers, wildly different answers. Uh, and so they all gave me pretty much the same type of answer. So one wasn't better or worse than the other one. But again, I suspect you really need a lot, much, much larger um, database, vector database to really, really try these out. But one thing that I did notice was uh, when I actually went back to my, my vector admin dashboard, uh, you can see some of the differences in the sizes. So let's just go and take a look at the ADA embed model first. And this is the standard 60.3 uh, megabytes, okay? But then when you actually look at the small here, you can see that it reduced the size, uh, it really didn't reduce the size that much, but you know, it reduced it a little bit. Uh, and then when you look at the embedding three large model, you can see that it's much bigger, right? Because it's actually adding more resolution. It's like, you know, improving the resolution of your photo, right? And so when you actually make a query, uh, the enhanced resolution in theory is supposed to offer uh, better performance, you know, and more detail, more, basically more detail. And again, with a large data set, this actually might make more of a difference. Uh, the smaller your data set is, it probably makes less difference. Uh, but again, it's something to check out. Okay, so the next thing that we want to look at is the support for Pinecone serverless. Now, if you're using Pinecone, if you, if you like to use Pinecone, uh, this is a great new service that they're offering. Uh, basically, they're going away from the, uh, the, pod, uh, the pod offering to the serverless off offering, where you basically pay as you go. Uh, and they give you $100 in uh, serverless credits. Uh, and again, it's very, very easy to set up. I, I really didn't have any issue with it. And what's cool about this is that you can actually change your dimension size. So if you are embedding uh, you know, a vector store or you're creating a vector database, unlike Chroma, you can actually change your, uh, di your dimensions. So you can actually take advantage of the... Um, of the open AI embeddings, especially the large models. But anyway, I uh, tested this out and I actually uploaded the same document, the art of game design to test it. And again, uh, this is using Pinecone serverless. I'm using the text embedding three large model. And I was you know, asking some of the same questions um, and I got similar answers. Uh, I didn't really get anything differently, but again, uh, this is something that is available now in Flowwise. Okay, so now let's talk about MMR search. And MMR stands for uh, Maximal Marginal Relevance Search. And this is supported in basically uh, four different uh, vector store databases right now within Flowwise. We have ZEP, we have Superbase, we have WeV8, and we have Pinecone. And so what this does is it essentially tries to give you uh, more diversity within your documents. 
that then FlowWise, your chatbot, uses to create your answers. And so normally when you create a query, it actually goes FlowWise or the chatbot takes your query, it goes to the, uh, the embeddings model, your vector store, and it normally looks for documents that are similar to your query. So if you're talking about traveling, you know, uh, traveling to Paris, it looks for documents that are similar to traveling to Paris. Uh, but with MMR, what it does is it also looks at documents that are actually different from documents that are similar to your query. Uh, and so basically it looks for more diversity. Uh, and so the idea is that by, you know, by mixing the similarity and the diversity, it actually gives you better answers. And so this is something that you should definitely try. One thing that I noticed uh, and that I learned, because I'm always learning things about uh, FlowWise, is that when you actually go and you look at, say, Pinecone, for example, and you click on additional parameters, right, you now have that additional uh, option for uh, max marginal relevance search. So normally it's similarity, but you can change it to MMR. And what you can also do, and I guess I just overlooked this uh, because I've been you know, working on different chatbots, is that this is a standard uh, top K uh, search results, uh, the standard setting, and you can actually change it to whatever you like. Now, the more documents that you return, because this represents the number of uh, results to fetch, um, the more it might actually impact your token usage, right? But it will give you more documents because the, uh, the default is four, and you know that may not really be enough. It could be, you could test it out, but the more documents you uh, retrieve, uh, the more um, comprehensive your answer should be. And you can also do the same with um, your MMR settings. So it actually has a separate settings for MMR that you can actually return. Uh, you know, you can uh, set how many documents you want to return for MMR, uh, and then it will use that within the, uh, the max marginal relevance search. And then Lambda, is actually a setting that attempts to uh, balance how much you want to focus on the similar results versus the, um, the diverse results, the results that are different from your query. Uh, and so the default here is 0.5. You can always play with that. And um, you know, again, over a large data sets, this can really improve uh, your answers, the results uh, from your queries. So this has been added to uh, Support. This is Flowwise now supports this uh, in addition to those other vector stores that we talked about. Now let's talk about briefly document compressors because this is actually very important uh, when it comes to developing future chatbots and being able to uh, have even more focus uh, when you have like a large data set. And we're not going to cover all of them, but uh, essentially what a document compressor does is it takes all of the, uh, the information in your vector store in your vector database, and it tries to filter them. Okay, so let's look at a quick example. Uh, if we go back to our document, um, our book, The Art of Game Design, you can see that there's a number of different topics and subjects when it comes to game design. So with our, uh, our document compressor, what we can do is we can actually just focus on a specific element of game design or game mechanics in this case. Uh, and then we're basically sort of, um, filtering everything so that when our user asks a question, we will get more results about game design uh, and you know potentially enhance the visitor's answers. So this is basically how it works. Uh, there's quite a few uh, retrievers, new retrievers that have been added to Flowwise that you can check out. This is something we'll have to take a look at in another video, but uh, it's now supported and um, you can go check it out. So uh, going into the next feature that has been added uh, recently, is the ability to have um, managed links in your web scrapers. And so basically this feature is supported in Cheerio, uh, Puppeteer, and Playwright. And so basically what you do is you just click on the manage links option. And so essentially what it does is it allows you to manage all the links that are scraped from your URLs. So if you click on fetch links, it'll actually go out and return all of the links that it found uh, either based on the web crawl or the uh, site uh, XML file. And so this is pretty helpful because you can change links if you want. You can, um, you can you know, take links away if you want. I wish that there was an option to actually add links, add custom links, even if they're different from your main URL. Uh, that would really, really be helpful. But uh, this is a new feature that has been added uh, to Flowwise that you, can, uh, that you can use. 
And so uh, now we come to the uh, one of the most exciting uh, features that have been added in FlowWise recently, and that is custom JavaScript functions. And as you know, we have had uh, custom tools for a very long time inside of FlowWise, but now we actually have custom JavaScript functions that are independent. They actually don't need um, an open AI agent to call them. You can call them independently. And with that, that opens up a whole new world of possibilities uh, because you, know, you can connect to different databases with JavaScript functions. Uh, you can do automations. Um, you can do just about anything that you, uh, you can imagine. So let's go ahead and take a look at these custom JavaScript functions and show you an example of how they might work. So with this shop bot, what we have is we wanna take a, a URL that goes to an article uh, let's say um, you know this particular article, for example, and we want to be able to create a a, a video script from this article. And so, with our chatbot, what we're going to do is we are going to first uh, fetch the HTML from that article, and uh, we're going to download it. And then, in the next JavaScript function, we're going to use regular expressions to actually extract just the text. Because if you actually look at um, one of the executions, we can see, this is a recent execution, um, we can see that when we don't do any parsing, it just returns all of the HTML, and that goes into the context window. Uh, and that uses up a ton of tokens. Um, and so what we wanna do is we actually want to filter it, uh, so we just get the text. And so uh, that's what the purpose of the, uh, the second JavaScript function is. And then with the text, that text then goes to our prompt template where we are instructing uh, our chatbot to actually create a video script based on the results. So, you know, um, you know please create an engaging YouTube video script. Okay, and so then um, we test it out <laughs> and it works really, really well, actually. It works really, really well. Um, you can always, you know, change your prompt template, but, um, after pasting in one of the URLs, it gives us a title and it gives us uh, the actual video script for that particular article, okay? And so that's just one of the things that you can do with custom JavaScript functions. But we wanna take this even further, you know, because once we actually create our video script, we actually wanna add some automation to it. And so for that, what we're going to do is we're gonna use another feature that has been added to uh, Flowwise, and that's something called the ending node. So instead of your LLM or your LLM chain being the, uh, the final node, you can actually set your custom JavaScript function as the ending node. So what we did was we actually took the output from our LLM chain and we created another custom function uh, that connects to an N8N um, workflow. And so from that workflow, what we're going to do is we're going to connect with our WordPress, uh, with a WordPress blog, and, um, and create a new post with the article title and the article content. And so if we go ahead and we see, uh, we take a look at our WordPress dashboard, we can see all of the, um, the posts that it made as a result of our, um, our chatbot. So this is all of our chatbot adding new posts to our, uh, to our WordPress blog. Uh, and then we can go ahead and you know uh, do whatever we want to with it. Um, and so this is a really, really powerful way and a, and a great feature that has been recently added to uh, Flowwise that's going to allow you to really create really highly capable and very powerful chatbots and, uh, and really sort of just open up the entire new game. And so uh, with that, we are going to talk about some other updates, some of the more recent updates that are coming um, in the next video. So I'll see you there.